about the introduction to evolution. So we're primarily going to talk about the generic focus of the theory of natural selection in Darwin and how that actually works. So Darwin is people's first thought when it comes to evolution. But here's the thing. Charles Darwin was not the only person at the time to create evolution. He did not create evolution in a vacuum. All Darwin did was provide the mechanism for evolution. So he provided this mechanism for evolution that actually works. Okay. Now, when you think about the mechanism of evolution, uh, we've had different scientists propose different theories up to Charles Darwin. Uh, some other scientists who were big deals was a scientist by the name of Lamarck. Now, Lamarck's theory, he's most famously known as the giraffe guy for most biologists. So his theory is you got this little giraffe here, and it sees a tree. The giraffe really wants those branches. So it's going to, through sheer will and determination, evolve a taller neck so it can reach said leaves. And as stretching and using of muscles is what's going to allow it to carry on with this uh, offspring. So that's what the main plan is, to carry on the traits that it inherited through its lifetime, uh, these acquired traits. So his idea was acquired traits are inherited. That was Lamarck. The problem with this idea was it was not ev ev easy to provide evidence for. And Darwin challenged this. So this here, Lamarckian theory, turns out to be wrong. But Lamarck was also, though, the first scientist at his time to start proposing ideas. So the idea was there, but it was not well-rounded. So Charles Darwin, through his trip and other scientists to help influence his work, he does his massive trip around the world, and he starts studying things. So there's some other scientists at the time. So these are the inspirations. Now we have to talk about the inspirations for Darwin to understand how Darwin came to his theory in order for also natural selection to check out. So inspiration. So things you need to know about Darwin's time period. In Darwin's era, in Darwin's era, people thought the Earth was about 5,000 billion years old. That's how old they thought the Earth was at the time. Obviously, as science advanced, this has changed. And the person who helped come up with this was a man by the name of Charles Lyell. Now, Lyell is considered the father of geology and a variety of different critical work. But his big thing is he discovers that the Earth is about 4.6 billion years old. But also, his ideas eventually shape that 4.6 billion years old. But his big thing is this idea of uniformitarianism. That the Earth is shaped by the same processes that shaped it in the past. Okay? So the processes affecting us today earthquakes, volcanoes, everything like that, are still going on in the past. And they're doing the exact same that's done now. So that's the idea of Lyell. It challenged some other ideas about geology. Well, Lyell's work there helped inspire Darwin and gives him a better time frame, because it's 4.6 billion years is significantly more than 5,000. Also, the other effects of Darwin is a man by the name of Mathis. Now, Mathis is a sociologist. And... Um, mathematician. Back then, everybody was a little everything. His big idea was this idea of struggle for existence. Basically, organisms are going to get to a point where they compete for food, and there's going to be a struggle for existence. And that is what shapes populations. Eventually, populations are going to get so many that it's going to hit this wall, and it's going to crash. Now, we in biology call this the carrying capacity. And this capacity is critical for Darwin, because the struggle for existence also helps shape his ideas. And lastly, uh, the scientist by the name of Cuvier, he begins to do work on fossils. Now, one thing he starts proposing is these fossils we're finding are not fossils of organisms of today. These bones we're finding are actually fossils of organisms that have gone extinct a long time ago. So he proves the evidence of that organisms are dying off and have died off, and that's normal. And this is all three of these, along with Lamarck's ideas even, help shape Darwin's ideas of something we call natural selection. Now, natural selection, all this is, is typically viewed as the survival of the fittest. That is the common vernacular that most people know. Uh, Darwin's work is well ingrained in our society. We know what survival of the fittest is. The problem is most people don't understand what it means to be fit. So in order to understand natural selection, we need to understand 
the steps to natural the steps of the process. So natural selection has four key steps. First step is over reproduction. That means the number of individuals produced, these number of individuals produced are going to far exceed the population. Okay? So this is carrying capacity. So we're taking um, Mathis's idea of so it's a struggle for existence, and we're going to say we get too much overproduction. This is going to lead to a situation. Now, when you have to have this, you have to, in order for natural selection to occur, you must have this key component, variation. And that is the same population of organisms, every other one of them, slightly different. Now, this variation happens through what we eventually learn is genetics, that organisms take on different appearances over time. And that is very important as well as anything else we talk about. Without variation, natural selection does not occur because that means all organisms look identical to each other and they are the same. Now, once you have overreproduction and variation within the population, you're going to result in a theory of competition. And that's where organisms are going to fight for survival. This is really what's going to tie in Mathis's idea. Now, Mathis says that organisms are going to fight whenever food and resources become thinner. Now, those resources could be a variety of different things. They're not just limited to food and water. It could be reproductive mates. It could be habitat. It could be not being eaten by your predator. Those are all valid competition. So there's going to be some sort of pressure that comes in here, and it's going to cause the competition to ramp up, and it's going to target out certain individuals. So in this situation here, the squares are slowly fading out. Now, over time, if competition is strong enough, you're going to result in success. And the success is organisms that survive the best are going to be the more dominant one in future generations. And as you see here, the circles are surviving a lot more favorably, and the squares have dwindled. Now the squares aren't fully removed from the population. Now this keeps going on for thousands of years. So after thousands of years, you'll result in evolution, and likely extinction. Likely, the members of the species that's being outcompeted against will eventually phase off and then probably will go extinct. Not always, though. Organisms can descend from the same branch and still live on. But evolution and extinction are often intertwined with each other. And this brings us to our last thing, and that is, what is evolution? Now, evolution we're going to give different definitions to as we go. But what you need to understand is evolution is basically a change in species. Now, how the species goes about is something we're going to talk about in future videos. There's a lot more work here that needs to be done. So we need to know more than just natural selection. Natural selection is the primary source of evolution. It's the primary force of evolution. But it is not the only thing that causes evolution. And that concludes, tonight, and that concludes today's video. If you have any questions, be sure to ask, email, whatever you need to do. I appreciate it, and see you all later.